Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, chapter 11, part 2, muscles of the appendicular skeleton, specifically muscles that move parts of the appendicular skeleton. So let's start with muscles that move the pectoral girdle. Here in this image we can see four versions. We have the trapezius, this large muscle in the back that will rotate, adduct, and depress the scapula. Then we have these two smaller muscles in the back, the rhomboid major, that elevates, adducts the scapula and rotates it downward, and the rhomboid minor, which is a superior to the rhomboid major, and it elevates and adducts the scapula and rotates it downward. And then we have the lavator scapulae, which elevates the scapula and rotates it downward. And you can see here with the levator scapulae that its origin is located on the first four cervical vertebrae, specifically their transverse processes. And the insertion is the superior vertebral border of the scapula. Next, we have the pectoralis minor, which is deep to the pectoralis major, and it abducts the scapula and rotates it downward. And its origin is ribs two through five, and its insertion is the coracoid process of the scapula. And then we have the serratus anterior, which uh, runs sort of along the lateral side of the thoracic cavity. It, has, it abducts the scapula and rotates it upward. Its origin is ribs one through nine, and its insertion is the verbal border and inferior angle of the scapula. Next, muscles moving the humerus. These include the deltoid muscle up at the shoulder area. It abducts the arm at the shoulder, and it can flex and medially rotate the arm, and it can even extend and laterally rotate the arm. Its origin is the clavicle and the acromion and spine of the scapula up here. And its insertion is the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. It's worth pointing out that the deltoid is a rather broad muscle. And the reason it can engage in so many different activities is because different parts of it can uh, contract, con contract um, separately. And then we have the pectoralis major, uh, which is basically the front of the chest. Um, as a whole, it can adduct and medially rotate the humerus. And its origin runs along the clavicle, the sternum, and the coastal cartilages of ribs two through six. Its insertion is the greater tubercle of the humerus. Then we have other muscles that move the humerus, including the latimus dorsi, which is a big, broad muscle among the mid and lower back that extends, adducts, and medially rotates the arm at the shoulder, which means it inserts into the humerus. Then you have the teres major, which extends the arm at the shoulder and assists in adduction and medial rotation of the arm. And then superior to that, the teres minor, which laterally rotates and extends the arm at the shoulder. We also have the supraspinatus muscle. It assists the deltoid in abducting the arm. Its origin is the supraspinous fossa of the scapula, and its insertion is the greater tubercle of the humerus, right there. And then we have the infraspinatus muscle. It laterally rotates the arm at the shoulder. Its origin is the infraspinous fossa of the scapula, and its Insertion, again, is the greater tubercle of the humerus. So again, these two muscles are named after their origins. Then we have the subscapularis back here. It medially rotates the arm at the shoulder. Its origin is the subscapular fossa of the scapula. And its insertion is the lesser tubercle of the humerus. And then the coracobrachialis, which uh, is located here, deep to the biceps brachii. 
Its origin is the coracoid process of the scapula. Its insertion is the middle of the medial surface of the humerus. Now for muscles that move the radius and the ulna. Well, we have the biceps brachii. The biceps brachii here can flex the forearm at the elbow. It can help supinate the forearm at the radio ulnar joint. And it also flexes the arm at the shoulder because one of its heads actually makes it able for it to cross two joints, both the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. So the origin of its long head is the superior portion of the clinoid cavity of the scapula, while its short head is um, the coracoid process of the scapula. And then its insertion is the radial tuberosity of the radius. Next, we have the brachialis, which is deep to the biceps brachii. And the brachialis will flex the forearm at the elbow. Its origin is the distal anterior surface of the um, humerus. And its insertion is the coronoid process of the ulna. We also have the triceps brachii. Triceps brachii is on the posterior side of the humerus. It extends the forearm at the elbow. And it also extends the arm at the shoulder because, again, it, it has heads that cross both the shoulder and the elbow joint. So for origins, its long head has an origin at the inferior, inferior location to the clinoid cavity of the scapula. And its lateral head its, uh, origin is the lateral and posterior surface of the humerus. And then its uh, medial head is the posterior surface of the humerus inferior to the radial groove. And then the insertion is the uh, olecranon of the ulna. And then down here we get the small muscle, the anaconius, which extends the forearm at the elbow. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And its insertion is the olecranon of the ulna. Then we have other muscles that move the radius and ulna. We have the pronator teres located here. It pronates the forearm at the radial ulnar joint, and it can also weakly flex the forearm at the elbow. Its origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus and the coronoid process of the ulna. And its insertion is the midlateral surface of the radius. Then we have the brachioradialis. This muscle, located here, will flex the forearm at the elbow and it also supinates and pronates the forearm at the radio ulnar joints back to the neutral position. Just so it doesn't completely supinate or pronate them, but returns them back to the more neutral position. Its origin is the lateral border of the distal end of the humerus. And its insertion is, the superior, is superior to the styloid process of the radius. Now, if we go deep and remove some of the muscles of the forearm, we also see the supinator. This small muscle will supinate the forearm at the radial ulnar joint. And we also see the pronator quadratus down at the distal end of the forearm. And it also moves at the radial ulnar joint. This case, obviously, it pronates the forearm. Now, muscles that move the wrist and hand. We have the flexor carpi radialis, located here. This muscle flexes and abducts the hand at the wrist. Its origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is the second and third uh, metacarpals. Then we have pulmaris longus, which is weakly flexes the hand at the wrist. Its origin is, the again, the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is actually in the palmar um, aponeurosis, or flat connective tissue. And then you have the flexor carpi ulnaris, which will, again, have its origin in the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and also superior and on the superior posterior border of the ulna. And then its insertion is in the pisiform, the hamate, and the fifth metacarpal. And it's worth pointing out that the palmaris longus is not present in about 20% of the population. And it turns out from various tests that have been done that it has no apparent effect whether you possess or lack the palmaris longus. 
All right, if we go deep, we see a few more muscles that can move the wrist and hand. We have here this broad muscle called the flexor digitorium superficialis. It flexes the middle um, and proximal uh, phalanx of each finger, and it also flexes the hand at the wrist. Then you have the flexor pollicis longus here and here, and it involved in flexing the distal phalanx of the thumb. And then you have the flexor digitorium profundus, which is deep to the flexor digitorium superficialis, and it flexes the phalanges of each finger, and it also flexes the hand at the wrist. Then if we flip the hand over, we have the uh, extensor carpi, carpi ulnaris, which will extend and adduct the hand at the wrist. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, as well as the posterior border of the ulna, and its insertion is the fifth metacarpal. And then we have the extensor carpi radialis longus here, and it extends and abducts the hands at the wrists. Its origin is the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, and it inserts into the second metacarpal. Then we also have a, a few more muscles here. We have the extensor digitorium located here. Extensor digitorium extends the phalanges of each finger and also extends the hand at the wrists. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is the distal and middle phalanges. And then the extensor digiti minimi, which is right here, it extends the phalanx of the little finger, the proximal phalanx of the little finger, and it also helps to extend the hand at the wrist. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is the fifth phalanx. And then the extensor carpi radialis brevis, right here, and it extends and abducts the hands at the wrists. Again, its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, and its insertion is the third metacarpal. Then deep to these, we have the extensor indices. Right here, it extends the index finger as well as extending the hand at the wrist. You have the uh, extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Both of these muscles help to extend the um, thumb, as well as extending the hand. And the extender pollicis longus also can help to abduct the hand at the wrist. wrist. And then we have the abductor pollicis longus, which helps abducts and extends the thumb. And it also can abduct the hand at the wrist. Now I move on. Uh, we're going to, no, we're going to stop here.